All right, so welcome back to Computer Science S76. This is the last time we'll meet in this more formal setting. Recall that next Wednesday is our app party, at which point all of your projects will be more than several days done, most likely. And we'll gather in the lab room, and we'll have some cake and some snacks and some chit-chat. And the goal will be to bring your app, to bring your laptop as appropriate, and actually demonstrate what you did not only for your last project, but maybe your first project or two as well, particularly if you took a novel approach to the user interface or generally just want to show off. So tonight we wrap up our look at iOS. But first, a couple of thanks. Um, you know that we've had uh, a team of folks behind the scenes here and in front of the camera, namely Chris and RJ and Rob. So I just wanted to publicly thank them for all of their efforts thus far. Thank you. And also to folks you haven't probably met in person, but Shelly and Ramon and Dan, who've been running things behind the scenes. So thank you to them as well. Um, just in case you would like to relive this summer experience, um, realize that the videos will remain online at cs76.tv for the next few years, most likely, for better or for worse. Um, so if after the class ends and you're back in school or back at work, you'd like to at least review material or pull up PDFs or sample code or the like, um, know that that will continue to survive on the internet. So feel free to tune in there. So a couple of uh, outstanding details here. So we started the semester looking and talking about web apps versus Netflix native apps. Someone want to recap in just a sentence or two what the distinction is and was? Five weeks later, what's, what's a difference? OK, good. So web apps are much more portable. You can use them across browsers. OK, good. But certain special hardware is typically inaccessible to you, things like the accelerometer for which browsers like Safari and the like don't necessarily provide an API to. Good. Other thoughts? Native apps run natively on the iOS, whereas web apps have to be downloaded every single time you make a connection using OK, so web apps do have to be downloaded via HTTP in the context of a browser before they can actually be run. Um, but you kind of give us a circular definition before. What does it mean for native apps to be native? OK, good. So you don't have to retrieve them from some other source other than the first time installation from the App Store, which is another compelling feature, perhaps. Most people know how to find apps in the App Store, but most people probably don't know how to actually bookmark a web page so that it appears to be an application, which was a technique we looked at way back early on. So if you had to choose right now for your third and final project, which you do, um, how many folks are leaning toward or already down the road of web apps? OK, so a handful, six or so, in the native apps. OK, and most everyone else. So not bad at all. So we'll have a good mix of at least both uh, at that final class. So all right, so that was web apps versus native apps. What if you didn't necessarily have to choose between two such stark contrasts? Well, it turns out that there are wrappers, the most popular of which is probably something called PhoneGap, which allows you to write web apps but create the illusion of them actually being native apps. And by this, I mean you go to PhoneGap's website and you download what's kind of essentially starter code that they have written for Objective-C, for Java, uh, for Windows Phone, for a whole bunch of other platforms as well. And they've implemented in different ways in each of those languages hooks into the native hardware and then have exposed that via JavaScript to web code. So in short, you could in theory implement a, an application entirely in HTML5, CSS, and JavaScript, but you could actually ship it to the Apple App Store. And a user could download it, and they would have an icon, and they would have gotten it for free or 99 cents, whatever the case may be. And when they run it, it's actually native iOS code running on the phone, but the contents of the rectangular window are largely coming from some website externally. In fact, this is how the earliest version of the Facebook application was written. Um, some of you might recall that it used to be much slower, which is actually a downside of taking that approach. You don't necessarily get the same uh, lack of latency that you might in an iOS uh, native application. But the upside is, one, you don't have to learn uh, Objective-C in iOS. Two, you have uh, access to tools and more familiar environments, which for most people is web-based these days. And three, 
Yeah, I'm kind of out of reason. So two. So you have two pretty compelling reasons. So how do you go about doing this? Well, technologically, this is actually implemented in kind of a clever way. So first and foremost, this technique using PhoneGap actually gives you access to quite a bit of hardware in contrast to what we proposed was the case a few weeks back. So all of the green boxes here represent uh, in native hardware that is supported on Android, BlackBerry, iOS, Windows Phone, and so forth. Things like the accelerometer, the camera, um, the compass, and other details that are typically inaccessible to JavaScript, but by downloading this starter code, which is native, you're therefore providing a bridge of sorts between native code and JavaScript code. And the means by which they did this in the iOS platform, though it differs on others, is the PhoneGap folks essentially register with their iOS native application URLs of the form gap colon slash slash and then something. And they essentially have an MVC style approach here where you can then specify as part of this URL a class name and a command or a method to actually call and then some number of arguments. So in other words, they kind of made up their own uh, sort of faux protocol by teaching iOS to handle URLs that appear inside of a browser window via code that they've written. So it turns out there's a, pro a protocol called UI WebView Delegate. And if you implement this, you can actually be the code that is invoked when an otherwise foreign URL is used in the confines of an embedded web browser. And indeed, that's how PhoneGap works. You write web code that you therefore embed inside of a rectangular window that's just an embedded web browser. And if you want to talk to the native hardware, you essentially do this by way of the URL bar. So this delegate class allows you to specify what code should get invoked when the embedded browser window sees a URL that starts with gap colon slash slash. And meanwhile, there's also a UI web view. This is the class, even if you've not used it before, that allows you an iOS code to embed a browser inside of your own native app. And it turns out there's a method associated with this class called string by evaluating JavaScript from string which means that your code can be injected into the local browser and then executed by way of this method. So in short, this provides a bridge of sorts between native iOS code and the browser by way of this URL-based trick. And there's one other step to this, um, whereby, um, well, rather, in other operating systems, this is done a little bit differently. But in short, Apple provided enough in the way of hooking that folks like PhoneGap were able to come along and allow you to implement your next app as really a web app underneath the hood, composed almost entirely of JavaScript with a bit of Objective-C that some other folks have written. So I would consider that, perhaps, for your next project um, well beyond the course, if that's of interest. Questions? All right, well, what about provisioning? Sadly, some of you have struggled with this this past week. As you may know, a hacker or some uh, uh, a, a persecuted white hat type person um, found some vulnerabilities in Apple's developer portal, the result of which is that he was able to compromise, supposedly, a whole bunch of names and email addresses of all of us who have perhaps registered for the iOS developer portal. And to my knowledge, this was the first time that Apple uh, proceeded to take the entire thing offline for, I think, over a week, which is wonderfully poorly timed for someone's like us. So apologies to those of you who have struggled with this, but this means now that the thing is starting to come back online, you can in fact provision your device to run software written by you. So if you have an iOS device, iPhone, iPad, or iPod, you can eventually, if not already, go to a URL like this, follow the online documentation, and frankly, this is one of the biggest headaches of iOS development, just getting your damn code onto your own phone. It's not nearly as simple as it is in the Android world or in other platforms forms because you essentially have to upload a public private key pair or portion thereof to Apple so as to register some cryptographic key with them. Then your code has to be digitally signed in such a way that it's allowed to run on your own phone even if you're doing all this at home with a USB cable um, and this costs you only $99 a year for this privilege. So long story short, this is a huge headache and every time I go, it changes every year um, but you can kind of muscle through it with the documentation which has gotten better over time. But the end result is that you can run the software on your own phone. If you want to distribute it to friends, you'll have to go by way of the App Store, or there are ways over the air that you can distribute apps for testing sake. And there's also, for those of you who work professionally, there's an enterprise level uh, account for $299 a year or $199 that allows you to share code that you've written with other folks on a development team, which makes it a little easier to at least share and test software among each other. 
So not a particularly fun process, but there is quite a sense of gratification, I think, once you've gotten your own code working on your own phone. So aspire to that, perhaps, for next week and realize you don't have to pay any of those fees. Assuming the member center, as it's called, is back up and running, we can provision your phone for you. Um, you can fill out the form that's linked on the course's website and in the specifications so that you can then um, use our academic account, at least for the remaining couple of weeks of summer school. All right, so we're fortunate today to be joined by folks who will bring us two different perspectives um, on how mobile software development can be done. First is Dan Armendariz, who's a buddy of mine and also the former instructor of this course. Back in the day, we dabbled in both iOS as well as Android development, and Dan has come back from California to join us for an hour's chat this evening about how Android development compares and contrasts with native iOS development. We're also fortunate to be joined by a friend of ours from down the street at Microsoft Nerd, uh, New English and Research and development. Um, Bob Familiar is joining us tonight to take a look at Windows Phone development and also some of the latest features in uh, Windows 8. So for those of you who have been following some of the progression of that operating system, even has a neat beta and demo for us to take a look at. Um, so without further ado, allow me to introduce Bob Familiar, who will join us for the next hour. Bob, All right. thanks, thanks so much. So good evening. Uh, First, I just want to thank you for uh, the opportunity to be here and, and to uh, talk to you. Uh, as David said, uh, my name is Bob Familiar. I'm the Director of Technical Evangelism for Microsoft here in the Northeast. Uh, myself and my team, we work with students and professional developers. We, we teach them how to build apps for Windows Phone, for Windows 8, uh, leveraging our cloud, Windows Azure. Um, and uh, you know, we do that through um, activities that we do online, through our blogs, through engaging in technical forums. We also run uh, a lot of hands-on workshops on college campuses and at our offices uh, across the country. So what I want to talk to you about tonight is modern app development on Windows. Uh, so the agenda is I just want to talk about you know, what's it mean to develop for Windows, uh, I'm going to dig in a bit. We'll look at some code. We'll talk about building apps that use open data APIs. So if you've uh, been interested in building apps for iOS or for Android or for Windows and you're interested, hey, you know, I'd like to do something with that Instagram API or it's Yelp or Facebook, Twitter, I'm going to kind of go over that design pattern. Uh, I'm going to show you some examples. We'll dig into it. Now, my, myself, I'm a C-sharp developer, so I'll be using the C-sharp programming language uh, to demonstrate that. But the great news is, is the pattern I'm showing you is applicable, uh, you know, really uh, very much in a cross-platform way. And you just, you know, the, there's different ways to implement it, whether you're doing uh, JavaScript or uh, you're, you're developing in Java for Android or, or on the, the Apple platform. It's just uh, uh, changes in language syntax at that point. And I'll close out and just uh, really dovetail nicely with what David was talking about with PhoneGap. I'm going to cover uh, just the cross-platform app and game development landscape. Uh, as you go into this space, if this is your, uh, uh, you know, this is your career aspiration, uh, one of the things you really want to understand is what are all the different ways that you can build apps and games for these platforms. And if you're doing it professionally, there may be value in leveraging cross-platform frameworks and tools. Uh, so I'll just give you a sense of what they are, uh, what platforms they support, what languages, and what skill sets you might need. Um, but you know, knowing how to do something natively is a fantastic skill to have. But also, there may be business reasons why a cross-platform framework or tool will make sense. And, uh, and we'll just go over that briefly. And I'll finish out with uh, uh, pointing you to a whole bunch of uh, resources that we have for you. Uh, so when you think about developing for Windows, uh, you know, obviously we made a significant uh, change in the experience of Windows when a user first uses it. They're presented with this start screen. Um, the apps that used to be on the start uh, menu are now represented as tiles. And these are, uh, in many cases, live tiles. So the, the tiles themselves will update with information. Um, it's a touch-first experience. It's very, uh, uh, you know, our, our uh, goal is it's very immersive um, and allows uh, a user to really get to what they want to do very quickly. Um, I'll, I'll demonstrate some apps for you to show you, show you that. Another key point uh, from a developer's perspective is that we provide you language choice. 
So you can develop natively on Windows and on Windows Phone uh, in C++, in C Sharp, but also in HTML5 and JavaScript. Uh, so that, uh, you know, opening up the platform natively for web developers was, uh, was you know, a big shift. And the way we do that, I'll describe what the platform architecture is a, a little bit. Um, but the bottom line is there's a common runtime. So regardless of what language you use, you have access to the full API set natively. Uh, so it's really about a, it's a skill set decision for you. Um, so let's, let me just demonstrate a couple of apps for you so you get a sense of you know, when you're targeting the Windows platform, how do you really differentiate your app from others? Well, first off, you know, this is, this is the main start screen in Windows 8. Uh, I'm running a, uh, this is an Asus ZenBook Prime Touch, so it's got a touch screen. Um, I can see all my apps. I can uh, easily you know, scroll through them with touch. I can pinch zoom, and this way I can see all the different uh, categories that I've uh, defined. If I want to uh, run an application, let's say I want to go to the, uh, the Microsoft Store, I simply touch it, or of course I could click it with the mouse. It's the one other interesting thing about the platform is everything within uh, Windows is still fully functional with keyboard and mouse. But we've made it also uh, a, a, t a very, very good touch-first experience. So now I'm in the store, and if I was interested in purchasing Halo Spartan Assault, you know, I could go in here and I could check it out, I could see uh, the different screenshots, I could look at uh, reviews, and so on. And I could choose to purchase it, which in this case I already have, so it knows that. Now, if I'm an app developer, one of the things I might wanna do is make sure that the tile itself is providing value to the user. So you can, you can have what's called a live tile. And there's a couple examples here. You see uh, some tiles updating with the different images. You can see the store tile is telling me that I have an update. So these are things that you as a developer can take advantage of. Um, the user could choose to turn that off or turn it on at any time, but it's uh, something that if you pro are providing, uh, let's say status of your game, you might wanna ha list what the recent high score is, or maybe if it's a multiplayer game that you might wanna tell the user it's their turn. You know, it's a chess game. The person you've been playing with has made their move. Now it's their turn to go in and play the game. So you could actually do that without the app actually running. So it's uh, pretty powerful. Um, another thing that you can do is you can provide different tile sizes. So uh, on uh, Windows 8, we, we give you the option of a, a wide tile uh, or uh, a standard 150 by 150 tile. It's another way you can, you can differentiate. You don't, the wide tile is optional, but it's so you supply that if you want to uh, provide that, that capability for the user. Uh, now let's see. Let's, uh, let's go here. So this is the uh, all recipes application. So this just gives you an example of sort of the uh, design language that we are uh, promoting with Windows 8. It's, it starts with it being chromeless, right? So what that means is you're not seeing any decoration, uh, uh, let's say operating system window decoration here, right? Traditionally in Windows, if you were open to window you know, on, the, on Windows 7, on the desktop, there would be an edge to the window, there would be um, minimize and open and close buttons in the upper right hand corner, there might be uh, a menu across the top, there's a lot of stuff going on in this window. Here, uh, the philosophy is content is king. Content of the app is the centerpiece. And so you see very uh, 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 vivid you know, images being used. You, you're, the, the user is, is, uh, uh, gu is guided through this application. They navigate through it um, with, uh, by the use of topography. So you know, really nice looking fonts different sizes mean different things. Um, I'm interested in recipes that deal with bacon, all right? So I know I can just click on that, I can touch that, and now I'm seeing all the recipes that, uh, that, that match that particular category. If I wanna go back, I can see in the upper left-hand corner, little breadcrumb arrow, I know that I can navigate back to the main screen. 
So there's a lot more to that design language. Uh, we, we refer to that as modern app design. I think initially when we released it, we referred to it as metro design. Uh, but now it's modern app design, and if you go to design.windows.com, there's a great deal of documentation on this design language. It's, it's guidance on how to make a really uh, beautiful application uh, on Windows. Some of the other things this app demonstrates is the integration with the operating system itself. So I just swiped from the right-hand side. I brought in what's called the charms bar. So this is also capability. As a developer, you have access to, the, to this platform features from your application. So for example, search. If I click on search, what you'll notice is the search flyout panel comes in and all recipes is selected by default. So when I do a search now, I'm going to be searching all recipes. But you can see that uh, there are a number of other applications that have registered themselves with Windows and are making themselves available for search. But if I was interested in cookies, in all recipes, that search is now being, that search uh, query was just passed to the application and the application then decides how it wants to deal with it. So any application can tie into the search capability that's built in to the operating system. Simply registers itself as a search target. When the user types in terms, so your application could do that. All right, so you, you could just tie into that feature. And the same with uh, uh, sharing. So this says this app can't share. All right, so this app hasn't implemented this feature. But what you could do in an app that would share is it might say, I, I la uh, I'd like to share whatever information's on the screen, in which case, it might be interesting to see if I go into a particular recipe if it allows me to share. There we go. So now that I'm on a particular recipe, it says, in all recipes, the user says, I want to share this recipe. Well, what comes up are all the applications that have registered with Windows that support sharing as a, as a share target. So All Recipes doesn't know how to share with Mail, doesn't know how to share with OneNote or SkyDrive. The operating system knows how to do that. All Recipes simply saying, I want to take this information, which is this recipe, and share it out. And the user gets to choose where they share it. So that's another way that you can differentiate your app on the platform, take advantage of search and share. Now, All Recipes, that's a great example of an HTML5 application. That was built in HTML5 and JavaScript for Windows. Um, an example of a game uh, that's built in HTML5 and JavaScript is Cut the Rope. So it's a popular game. It's on all platforms. It's available in the browser. What this team did is they, they took their HTML5 and JavaScript code, and in about two weeks, they had it running on Windows 8, very early on in the, in the uh, beta time frame. So, you know, just to give you a sense of, you know, the kind of uh, performance that you can get. I'm going to embarrass myself and try to play this game here, so. There we go. Two out of three. It's okay. There you go. But that's HTML5 and JavaScript. Pretty performant. Um, that's because whether you're building in C++, C Sharp, or HTML5 and JavaScript, there's a common runtime for all those languages. Now, you can actually build and you can get closer to the metal and go C++ native, in which case you are uh, not leveraging that, that common language runtime. But um, you know, for, for most cases, for most applications uh, and games, uh, that's, that's actually uh, quite sufficient from a performance perspective. If you're writing something like Halo Spartan, then you're probably, you know, and you're doing 3D modeling and things of that sort, you're, you're going to be right on the metal with C++. Um, here's an app that's written in C Sharp. This is Cocktail, Cocktail Flow. So this is just also showing you, you know, that, that design language that I talked about earlier. It's, a, it's guidelines. The, as a developer, you get to decide how you want to uh, implement that that particular, uh, uh, you take that guidance and, and apply it to your app. But here's an example where we've got this really just beautiful, immersive application. Looks great on that big screen. Um, and you know, maybe you're interested in, in how you make this particular drink. You see the nice animations, fantastic imagery. 
Um, and and uh, it's very fast. And we used to, we, uh, when, when this first came out, you know, we would refer to apps like this as fast, fluid, immersive, and beautiful. That's really at, at the core of the philosophy of that uh, design language. This is a game that's built in C Sharp. Not seeing uh, all the power of this, but you get a sense of what this is. Uh, Let's go. One more. I've lost. All right. Very sad. But the point is, you can build apps, you can build games in, in your language of choice. Now, we make that possible, as I said earlier, because we have this common runtime, WinRT, Windows Runtime. And on top of that, you have your choice of language, C or C++, C Sharp or Visual Basic, HTML, and JavaScript. There is something called XAML, Extensible Application Markup Language. That, that is the language that you would combine with C or C++ or C Sharp or Visual Basic that does the layout of the UI. Um, so you can think of it as equivalent to HTML, HTML with JavaScript, XAML with C Sharp. That's the, uh, sim same relationship there. So what I want to show you now is if you were interested in getting started to build an application for Windows, what do you need? Well, I'm going to start with Visual Studio. So Visual Studio is the development tool. You're students, so you have access to Visual Studio at professional at no cost through our DreamSpark program. So if you're not signed up at DreamSpark, please do. In fact, in the Applied Sciences and Engineering um, um, department, you actually have your own DreamSpark Premium, and you have a web store. Does, that, does this Correct. class know all about that? Uh, they, they plugged into that? They don't, but they do now. They do now. Beautiful. So uh, I don't know what the URL is to, that, to the Harvard web store, but if you if you go there, you can get access to all of our products at no charge. We make that available to students. So you're in Visual Studio. You want to get started. Well, I'm going to go ahead and click New Project. And the first thing you'll see is the way that we've uh, organized the templates is by language. So I've got Visual C Sharp here, um, but there are other, other languages, and I can expand that. And I could see, uh, here's JavaScript. So if I wanted to build uh, an app for the Windows Store in HTML5 and JavaScript, I could start with one of these templates. Right? Let's say a grid app. I'm going to say, OK, I want to get started. I want to build an app that's based on that grid layout that I, I saw with all recipes. It was very similar to Cocktail Flow. I want an app that sort of looks like that. Get started with that template. So now it's going to generate that solution. It's going to give you essentially all the scaffolding for that application. And by default, these templates use what we call model view, view model. So it's a variation on, on model view controller. Uh, but the idea is that you know, model view, that's the, that's the user interface layout that's done in XAML or be done in uh, you know, HTML and CSS. And then there's the, the view model. That's the data that you want to bind to your, to your user interface controls. All right? So that's uh, uh, sounded by you know, what David had said earlier at the beginning of the class, that you're familiar with model view controller. So model view, view model will feel very comfortable. Same concept. So here I am. Uh, I've generated this HTML5 and JavaScript Windows Store application. I'm going to go ahead and just run it on the local machine. See what I get for free. Starts up. This is the default splash screen. Here's an area you're going to want to have some focus on, right? Having a, a great looking splash screen is key. Now the app is running. So by default, you get a template that's laying out um, some pseudo information in groups 
And if I were to click onto a group header, I would see this uh, view, which is showing me the items within that group. Or I could click on a specific item, and now I'm looking at that specific item. So this is all placeholders for the data that is going to light up your application, right? So you can see this is, this is certainly not ready for the store, but all the scaffolding is in place, the navigation is in place. What you need to do now do is come in, apply design, and bring in the data of your application. That's going to be something I'll focus on when I talk about using these open data APIs. But the bottom line is you get a pretty functional starting place for your applications. I'll say file, new project again. So that was HTML5 and JavaScript. Now if I go to C Sharp, Windows Store, I can see I've got those same templates. I have a blank, I have a grid, I have something called a split app. So let's do grid in C Sharp. I say OK. I'm really going to get, essentially, it's the same application, but now the language is C Sharp and XAML. If I say go ahead and run this on the local machine, again, I get this default splash screen. The app is up and running, looks identical. All right. Now we also support building for the phone. So if I want to do that, I'd say, okay, I want to do, let's say, C Sharp for Windows Phone, and now here are all the different templates uh, that I could use for a Windows Phone application. So say I want to do a, a Pivot app. I'll say, okay. Well, what platform? Is it Windows Phone 8 or is it 7.1? I'm going to choose Windows Phone 8. Say OK. And right there in that window, you can see there's, uh, this is the, the XAML, which is defining the layout. Here is the uh, WYSIWYG editor, so I can see exactly what it looks like. And if I wanted to see, you know, wanted to dive into the code, I could open up a source file and dive in. I'm going to go ahead and run this. So what you're seeing here is we're em emulating the phone. So you get a, a, a you know, it's, it's a, uh, actually running as a virtual machine. Uh, and it's running the, the Windows Phone operating system. And, um, but it's fully integrated, so I can actually, you know, test it. There, uh, I can test it with touch, I can test it with the mouse, uh, and there are also some additional uh, things I can do, let's say like, uh, you know, pivot. So if, you're, if you wanted to make sure that your application would respond to the user, putting the device into landscape mode, make sure the, uh, the user interface responded to that, you could test that. Any questions so far? Go ahead. So if I build an application to Windows on an iPad, but I want to also make an iPhone application, like, will those effects be like, um, preserved if I turn that into an app? Right, so the question is, if I'm targeting the Windows platform and take advantage of some of the things that differentiate the app on Windows, the tiles and search and share, and those things aren't available on, on the other platforms. You know, how do you plan for that? How do you deal with that? So uh, later in the talk, I'll, I'll, I'll inform you on all the different ways you can build cross-platform apps and games. And, and, uh, but one of the things that you learn is that, especially in the area of apps, is the one thing you can't really replicate going from one platform to the other 
is the user experience, is the UI. So, so the first step in your architecture is separation of concerns. That's where model view controller comes in, or, or MVVC, as, uh, uh, MVVM, I'm sorry, that, uh, that, that we promote. The whole idea is separating the UI layout, UI logic, middle tier logic, data access. Make sure you've got good separation in your code. Because when you go to do something in a cross-platform uh, project, not all your code can go cross-platform. Typically what you have is the, you try to target the majority of your uh, logic is, that's not user interface related. That can be cross-platform. Uh, you try to choose a language that will get you cross-platform. That's the other thing you have to look at. But typically you'll do unique UI implementations on every platform because each one has their own controls, their own idiosyncrasies, their own uh, uh, features that, that you're going to want to uh, leverage. So, so great question. So the answer is no, right? Yeah, the short answer was no. The shorter answer is, well, it's, it's like anything else in, you know, been doing this a while, the, the, uh, the, the classic consulting answer is it depends. That's how you start answering any of those questions, right? And so you can take that as a skill and put that on your resume. You know how to say it depends. It just buys you time as you're trying to come up with the answer. So, so if you're ever in a consulting situation, you could start there. Yes? Um, how can you, so say you want to make like an app for like the Windows phone, um, you can really use like a compass for like the Windows 8. Like, you use it, how would you go about doing it in the Windows phone? As far as like um, gestures, not really gestures, but like more or less just like compass. Like right. So, so, uh, you know, both Windows 8 and Windows Phone have support for sensors, for um, uh, obviously touch, uh, and dealing with uh, accelerometers and gyroscopes, cameras. Those APIs exist. What's uh, the, when you start to get into that part of the API, that's probably where <clears throat> the majority are di of differences are between developing for Windows 8 and developing for Windows Phone. Is when you start to get into hardware-specific areas like that. Um, a, a large percentage of the uh, capabilities between Windows 8 and Windows Phone are shared. There's a shared core, which I believe is actually is a good lead into my next slide. Uh, between Windows 8 and Windows Phone, there's a shared core. Uh, probably gets you about 80% uh, commonality. But when you get into things that are specific to the hardware, it's just going to be different. You know how you how you deal with a, an accelerometer. On um, uh, in the Windows Phone space, where that's that's dealing with uh, phones from Nokia and um, you know uh, HTC and, and other phone manufacturers, and then you know on Windows, yes, we have a camera, we we deal, you know, we handle, we have sensor support and so on, a whole other set of hardware vendors. Uh, we try to abstract as much as possible, but but that's sort of where the differences lie. So. You, again, separation of concerns is key. When you're designing how the implementation, yeah, that's the kind of thing you want to encapsulate away into a class library. Uh, make sure it's something that's architecturally a little more plug and play. Yeah. Um, you showed uh, something that um, maybe makes an impact. Do you want to say that with um, the video? Yes. It's a great, great question. So the question is, if I'm already have an app for the browser, uh, and I'm using, let's say, jQuery, uh, and maybe some other JavaScript libraries, can I can I get that to run on Windows 8? The answer is yes. Uh, so uh, it's there. Well, I should have started. It depends. But the true <laughs> answer is is yes. It will work. Is it going to be just move your code over and hit run and it goes? No. So what you're going to need to do is. Uh, uh, first determine any third-party JavaScript libraries you're using. Um, do they work on Windows 8? Most do. jQuery, as an example, just works. Um, if you want to use jQuery for doing AJAX calls, no problem. Microsoft has uh, uh, libraries, uh, JavaScript libraries that you bring into your project that give you access to the WinRT APIs. So you'll need to add that into your project. You'll need to decide how do you want to um, where it gets interesting is dealing with um, 
scaling your UI so that it, you know, uh, has the, uh, the look and feel and, and, and a chromeless function on Windows 8, right? So you might have to adjust some of your uh, style sheets and, and things of that sort. Um, how do, do you want to integrate with Search and Share that's calling a specific Windows API? You'll do that through Microsoft's JavaScript libraries. But the third-party libraries, for the most part, uh, we've seen that they just work. Um, so a lot of them already tested. People are already using them. There's probably a lot of documentation on the internet how, how that's being used. So, uh, so the story there is it's a, it's a pretty good story. In fact, uh, a guy on my team by the name of Jesse Freeman, who's a, uh, a really well-known in the indie game development circles, he's, he builds games in HTML5 and JavaScript. And he actually teaches students to, who want to build games in HTML5 and JavaScript, he teaches them first to build it in the browser, and then the last class, they move it over to Windows, they get it running, and they submit it to the store. So, so he's got it down to a science on the gaming side. You're using Canvas, or if you're using, let's say, Impact JS, um, or uh, what's another one? Create JS is popular for doing HTML5 game development. Um, they just work. So. If I understand it correctly, it's got to be uh, faster than some games, right? It's not just pulling in a menu. It's really native. It's really native. Uh, where you would want to use PhoneGap, which is which is again another great choice if cross-platform mobile, if you're HTML5 and JavaScript, and you want to make sure you're going to work on all the platforms, then FOGAP is a great choice. If you want to take your existing browser, HTML5 JavaScript browser code, and just get it running native on Windows, that's another choice. And you might decide to do that, but then use PhoneGap for iOS and Android. So you could, these are all business decisions at some point, right? If you're in a startup, you're in a company, and they're trying to make decisions on investing time and money into building uh, mobile applications and which platforms to support, this is exactly the conversations that go on in, in the design meetings. And so it's good to kind of think through those things, maybe learn all the different ways to do it as, you, as you're doing it in this class and maybe in your own copious spare time. Try out all these different uh, approaches, and uh, you learn a tremendous amount about what each platform can do, which each you know uh, framework or tool like PhoneGap can do. Where the, where's the gap in functionality, and and so that that's just tremendous value that you bring to whoever you know a future employer might be. Uh, differentiated apps. By that we mean taking advantage of live tiles, right? Um, on the phone, you can actually have your app uh, be available on the lock screen, also on Windows 8. Um, there's there's a, uh, the ability to build applications that take advantage of the web camera and um, uh, do things with the lens, integrated wallet. Of course, if you're a game developer, there's an opportunity to be uh, branded Xbox. Right? So, so we work with independent game developers, game studios, and if um, um, you can always reach out to the Xbox team and say, hey, could you take a look at my game? And if they like it, they license it, you get to brand, uh, you get that nice little Xbox green bar across the top of your game. That will, that will push more downloads than anything else, is, is that, you know, uh, that little uh, um, sort of uh, attaboy from the Xbox team. So you'll, you'll drive a lot of attention to your app if it's, if it's uh, tagged with Xbox. So I'm going to dive back into Visual Studio uh, in a bit. What I want to go over is building apps that use these open data APIs. Uh, we've discovered um, that mobile developers who are learning to build for the various d mobile devices that are out there um, a lot of times you need some ideas, and open data APIs provide you uh, a ton of ideas. Let me just, I don't know if you've ever been out to this site. Uh, let me go to um, apihub.com. You go to apihub.com, and you could search or you could browse by category. You know, they've got over 13,000 open data APIs registered here. So if you're looking for data, because the data is really what makes an app interesting, right? And so if you're interested in building an app for healthcare or education, or you, know, you want to use you know, government data, 
Um, you want to, you know, you want to integrate maps into uh, into your salute into your mashup app. This is the place to go and at least get started finding what you're interested in. So, um, I'm, I want to build an educational application. Um, I want to use um, REST protocol. I'd like I like it to return JSON because uh, that's uh, and there I've got you know I've got the Khan Academy has an API. Uh, Donors Choose API, Google Books API, TED API. Hey, I'm start, you're starting to get some great ideas. I, yeah, I'd like to build a TED app, right? So uh, maybe I want to mash that up with, um, uh, with Bing Maps or Google Maps or something like that, right? Do, create a really interesting application. The data is what makes it interesting. So learning how to develop against these open data APIs is, a, is another very marketable skill. Once you've identified, um, where do I know? Let's go here to, to Mashery. Uh, Mashery is a, is a partner of ours. They, um, they're what's called an API curator. Go ahead and sign in. They've got over 50 APIs that they helped customers build and host. And uh, one of the ones that I've worked with is uh, Rotten Tomatoes. So I've just logged in. You can see all the different API keys I have. So once you start to work with these open data APIs, there's some things you need to know about them. Many of them require you to get a developer key. It usually doesn't cost anything. You just have to register, and then they give you a key. Uh, so for example, if I go to the dynamic documentation here for Rotten Tomatoes, which is movie information, I've logged in so they know, they know what my key is. And I've just selected my developer key. And now I can, I can use this API Explorer, which is in the browser. It's just a browser app. Um, and I can say, okay, I'm interested in building an app using the in-theaters data. Let me go ahead and try it. I want to see how this works. So I try it out. And what I see is... Let me zoom in here. You can, you can actually see what the API that, that they just fired, what it looks like. It's a URL, and it's got some parameters on it, and it, and it ends with my developer key. So they know that the, who's, who's making this call. And um, they send you back you know, what the data uh, would look like, which is right here. So again, I'll, I'll zoom in so we can see it a little better. This, this is the data coming back. And it's coming back as JSON, JavaScript object notation. So why, why does it do that? Well, APIs that are on the internet are architected to return very chunky data. Think of this. If you wanted to write an app that went and built a list of movies that someone could go see in a theater, would you want to make a call and say, okay, give me a movie, and that's one call. Now make another call, give me the second movie. Now give me the third movie. And you're doing that on the internet. And you know how internet connectivity is, you know, we're only at the very beginning of what the capabilities of that are from an infrastructure perspective. It's not, it's not always perfect. It's not always fast. It's not always there. So chunky data makes a lot more sense. Go get me 16 movies. All right, at a time, or 20 movies at a time. And not only that, not just the name of the movie, give me the title, the year, the rating, give me a critics' consensus, give me the release date, give me a synopsis, give me movie poster thumbnails. So uh, it's pulling back a ton of information. Who are all the actors in the film? All right, that's chunky data. That way you can make one API call on this you know, not very um, reliable internet connection. Get back a lot of data and now use it in the app. That makes a lot more sense. So this is the classic they used to call it chunky versus chatty, right? We want, we want our open data APIs to be chunky. Another thing you need to be aware of uh, about uh, uh, these APIs is they are sometimes throttled, which means the, the folks who are hosting the, this, a, these APIs and they're providing all this data for free, you get a developer key, but they might tell you you can only make 
two calls per second and no more than 10,000 calls a day. That might be one level of threshold. Another one might be you can make you know, five calls per second, uh, but you're limited to 100 calls a day. And if you want to do more than 100 calls a day, you need to pay us, right? So there's those kinds of uh, uh, scenarios as well. So do your research into the APIs you're interested in using. Determine if, if they are uh, bottlenecked in any way, if there's a threshold, a cap. Um, is there a cost? You know, what do you have to do to get a developer key? But then once you figure that out and you say, yeah, this is a reasonable API, it's open, it's free, it's not throttled, you know, it, I can build an app and I can get a thousand people using my app and all calling that API and I shouldn't have, I shouldn't exceed any threshold. That's kind of where you want to be to leverage these APIs. So I found my API, uh, I'm happy with the threshold limit, now I want to build an app. So, the place to start. When I go ahead and run this application, at least you'll see what it looks like. Then I'm going to come back and we'll walk through it. We'll probably set some breakpoints. So, another thing I'm pointing out here, this is the Windows 8 emulator. So, this is another way to run and debug your Windows 8 app. So, we have a phone emulator. We also have a, um, uh, a tablet emulator that's built into the tools. So you can run the app, I could run this app locally on my machine, but I could also test it in this, in this uh, uh, simulator. Uh, so again, I can make sure that uh, uh, I could simulate touch and I could change the resolution. That's another uh, nice feature of this. Windows runs on a lot of different devices. You wanna make sure that if you're building an app for Windows, that it'll work on anything from the size of a surface all the way up you know, to one of these. Right? So built into the uh, uh, simulator is the ability to change the screen resolution so you could actually see if, you are, if your layout is working regardless of what monitor uh, the user happens to be using. So here I am, I just made that API call to, uh, to Rotten Tomatoes and I got back uh, a bunch of movies which are in theaters and I could select one of those movies and now I can see, you know, I, I, before I got a thumbnail of the poster, now I can actually see this movie poster and I'm getting the synopsis and the rating and the audience score. So I didn't have, to, I pulled that data all the way back, right? So it came back, it's in my app. I'm now run, you know, working with this data completely locally on the device. And I can say now I'm interested in some reviews. Now I'm going back out to the internet. As soon as I said I want to, you know, look at some reviews of this movie, what Rotten Tomatoes gave me back was a, was a link to another API that I can invoke to get a list of reviews. And then for each review now is actually a web page. So I'm trying to connect to the New Yorker right now. And hopefully that'll come up in a second. But I can see the list of, of reviews here on the left hand side and I can actually read the review of the Despicable Me now in the New Yorker. All right. So that's what the app does. So the way I, I uh, built this app is I, uh, one of the nice things about Rotten Tomatoes, they actually give you nine different APIs that you can use. The way they design them though is pretty clever. Every API returns the same format of data. So this is an interesting thing, another interesting thing you'll find when you start to dig into these open data APIs. Some of them are well designed, some of them are not. Or some of them just, ha they weren't able to do something based on the data they're returning that is as um, clean as this. So each one of these APIs, and I've got them documented in my code, returns the same structure. It's a list of movies as you saw before in that, that JSON that I showed you. Um, I've also written uh, a, a sample app that uses Edmunds, which is, if you've ever been to Edmunds.com, that's where you can go look up new and used car information, right? So they have a developer API. Their de developer API is one of the most complex that I've seen because they have a vehicle API, they have a dealer API, they have a deals API, um, and they have 
uh, I believe, a reviews API. And then, so each one of those APIs is actually a collection of calls, and each one of their calls returns a different format. So you actually have to study each individual API and, and determine what the structure of it is to be able to deal with the data. So again, just be aware of that. So I've defined uh, the APIs for Rotten Tomatoes. I've got them all defined in here, so I could actually change this application to, to not show in theaters information, I could change it to show DVD top rentals. So how would I do that? Well, let's see. The best way to understand this is to probably set a few breakpoints. So let's see. We're going to set a breakpoint right there and right there. So this is, this is the point in code where I'm actually going to invoke the in theaters API. It's defined as a string. The next thing that happens is we take that and we use a, an object in the WinRT class library called HTTP client. That's the class that allows me to invoke a URL. So I simply instantiate that and I call the get string async that makes that API call. We'll set a breakpoint here as well so we can see what comes back. The next thing I do, now remember, that comes back as JavaScript object notation. It's going to come back as a string, a giant string that has all that movie information in it. So how do I deal with it in my application? The first step I have to do is do something called deserialization. And there's a library that does it for me. It takes that string and it will deserialize it into an object model in memory for me. So the only extra work I had to do is actually define what that object model is. Well, there are tools that do that for you automatically. So you don't have to necessarily write that code. But once that code is generated, you end up with a class that looks something like this. So I've got Rotten Tomatoes Movies, has a collection of type movie, and a movie is made up of an ID and a title and a year and a rating and a runtime. This is all that same information you saw in the JSON, right? But now it's represented as, C, as a C-sharp class. And so the deserialization process takes the string of JSON and turns it into a runtime object model based on the, this class structure here. One line of code does that. All right. You simply have to have the class to define, and there are tools that generate it for you. And it's this line of code right here that actually does the work. All right. So we'll we'll uh, we'll walk through that now. When when I, remember we're using model view view model, right? But what I get back from Rotten Tomatoes is not a view model; it's a data model. So I, now that I have all this movie information, it's extremely rich. It's more information than I want to put on the screen. And it's not in the format that's bindable to the user interface controls. So I have to map from the data model to a view model, and then after that, one line of code binds it to the UI. So I have to define my view model. So a view model would look something like this. It's a movie, well, and this is the reviews. Let me scroll down, I'll get to the movie information. We'll start there. I have a movie item. It's derived from this base class. Now, what, why is that? Well, let me scroll up, because I scrolled past it already. On Windows, what makes a class bindable is that it implements the interface I notify property changed. Model view, view model means that you, you put your data in the form of a view model, you bind it to the UI control, could be a list view, could be a drop down, a combo box, uh, a grid control, something like that. If the user interacts with it and changes it, you want your view model to be notified that the data has changed. If your program changes the view model, you want the model view to be notified that the data has changed and update automatically. 
all of that machinery of keeping the model view in sync with the, with the view model, the model view in sync with the view model, is handled automatically by the platform. Whether you're HTML5 in JavaScript or you're C Sharp XAML, C++, that's handled automatically. You simply have to derive from the right, you know, implement the right interface. In this case, it's I notify property changed. And there's the implementation. So now that that's implemented, I can now derive classes from this base class that are my view model. And that's all that this, that's going on in this, this particular uh, file right here. So if I come down, where was I? Uh, movie item. All right, so here's my movie item that's bindable. And it's simply got, it defines the data that I want to be able to put on the screen and then accessors, get and set accessors. That's it. Very straightforward code. And I'm being instant messaged by someone out at corporate. So just ignore that. Uh, so let's see. So that's the view model. The last thing I want to show you is, okay, if it, now that I'm, uh, everything's in the view model, then what happens? Well, when that call returns all the way back up to, the, to my user interface layer, I'm gonna end up here in the response from the call. I'm gonna get the data, I'm gonna copy it from the data model to the view model, and this is the line of code that binds it to the UI. We take all the movie data and we simply say it's the default view model for this. Let me bring up this, this particular UI layout, which is implemented in XAML. There's the binding definition right there, collection view source. So that's one of the nice features about the platform is a lot of that plumbing, all that capability that you expect these types of applications to have, it's built into the framework, the class libraries that we provide in WinRT. You just need to know how to wire it up. When dealing with open data APIs, you're gonna make a call, you're gonna get back that string of JSON, you're gonna deserialize it into a data model. You're going to map the data model to a view model, and then simply bind, and then your binding uh, code will pick up after that, and you've got it on the screen. Now, I wanted to show uh, an app that was built that way, but it's in HTML5 and JavaScript. Now, this is not my code. But I'm going to do my best to try to at least point out a couple of uh, couple of uh, interesting parts here. Interesting in JavaScript, that whole uh, you know invoking the API and getting back that string of JSON that doesn't happen in JavaScript. Why? It's coming back in JavaScript object notation. So the nice thing about calling these APIs from JavaScript is you get back an object model by default. In C Sharp, I had to map the string to an object model, so it's one extra step in the implementation. So here's an example of invoke, invoking the Meetup API in JavaScript. Let me see if I can find the call. Um, I'll make sure I'm in the right place. As I said, this is not my call. Here we go. Get upcoming meetings. So here's the API call that we want to make in our app, right? It's in, it's uh, just a URL. And we're setting up the parameters. And this is the built-in, um, you could use, obviously you could use jQuery to do this, use an Ajax call. But if you're using the WinRT JavaScript libraries, you can just use winjs.xhr. You give it the URL the response type, and then of course what code follows is the code that is going to deal with uh, the response. So you can see we're just dropping into a for each loop and then we're just gathering the info, he's just gathering the information about each of the meetups and he's putting it into the right collections 
that will be bound to the UI controls is exactly the same pattern that we did in C Sharp and XAML, but this is just using HTML5 controls, CSS, and JavaScript to do the implementation. If I go ahead and run this, <coughs> there we go. So he's uh, gotten back um, meetups near Boston filtered by keyword JavaScript. And if I click on one of these, he gives me a nice map, and he's also going out and he's using, this is a feature of Bing Maps, so he's, in, he's done a mashup between Meetup and Bing, and so the Bing Map is showing you all of the coffee shops that are near where the Meetup is happening, all right? And so Bing has a points of interest API. So once you have the geolocation of the meetup, meetup will give you a longitude latitude for the meetup. You can use that with Bing to say, give me back a list of points of interest. And so that's the mashup he's doing here. So again, interesting data makes for interesting applications. And the last thing I'll show you before I uh, go into the last part of the talk here is that same pattern, same capability is available on Windows Phone. As I told you, I did an implementation uh, for Edmonds with car data. So that's what this application is doing. It's going to go out to Edmonds. It's going to get first a list of makes. Acura, Aston Martin, Audi, and so on. And if I'm interested in Audis, I can click that and I'll get a list of the models. So that came back from Edmonds. And I say, uh, you know, I'm interested in an A8. Uh, it's then going to show me, hopefully it'll go back out to Edmonds and get me the images of an Audi A8. So I can salivate over them. my ultimate goal is to start a transportation business like Jason Stratham. That's, that's just a dream of mine, to be a transporter. So anyway, um, you have to know that movie, I guess, to get the joke. No problem. So we have the same capability on Windows Phone. Any questions? Very good. So this is just a visual of that pattern that I talked about. We invoke the API. It's an asynchronous call. That's also important. These, these calls you make to these open data APIs, and we fully support an asynchronous model on, on the phone and on, on Windows. It's an asynchronous call. That means your, the user is not waiting for that call to return. They can keep using your app. They can go use another app. Um, and then when the call returns, uh, your application will be notified. That's where you'll do the deserialization if necessary, copy to the, copy to the view model, and then bind to the UI. And we did all of that. So now I'm just going to dive into this cross-platform app development landscape discussion. Um, for C-sharp developers, this is one of the best uh, options you have out there for cross-platform support for iOS, for Android, for Windows, is with the tools and the frameworks from Xamarin. They're actually based, they're headquartered here in Harvard Square. Uh, the founder of this company is uh, Miguel de Acasa. He, uh, many years ago, uh, when Microsoft open sourced the .NET framework and the C-sharp language and standardized it, he took that and he created that implementation for Linux. And so he's been making his living building cross-platform tools and libraries uh, based on C-sharp and the .NET framework for <coughs> It's got to be 10 or 12 years now. And uh, the latest incarnation is Xamarin. And they provide a cross-platform uh, framework for, for targeting you know, all the mobile platforms. And uh, the nice thing here is, uh, to our discussion earlier, you can get 60 70% code reuse. Their model is you know, port the business logic, the cloud integration, the database access, that's portable. But do your user interface natively for each. 
because there's no substitute for a native UI. There just isn't. This has been something we've been trying to solve in computer science for many years. You can go back to the 80s. There, there were companies that were trying to spin up um, uh, cross-platform UI frameworks and tools, and they, they began to be called, they were referred to as least common denominator, or LCD, which meant they were the poorest implementation on every platform they ran on, all right? So that's not where you want to be. You don't want to be least common. You want your app to sing and to just be the most fantastic experience on whatever mobile device it's on. But at the same time, if you want to have the furthest reach, the most opportunity for downloads and for monetization and all of that, you want to be on as many mobile platforms as possible. So you need a strategy. It might be native on each platform. That's a strategy could be cross-platform with something like Xamarin, which means you're going to develop in C-sharp. And you can actually do debugging in Visual Studio for, for Android and for Apple and for Windows. So it's a great development experience. They've got a great product here. A lot of, a lot of uh, um, applications uh, are beginning to take advantage of that. Earlier stated, your HTML5 developer, PhoneGap, fantastic option for a cross-platform solution. Right? If you're a game developer, Unity just released their Windows 8, Windows Phone support for Unity. So you can now you know, take your, uh, we're actually told by Unity that about half the games in the iOS store are built with Unity. So we know there's a lot of Unity developers out there. It's a great tool. It's on the high end, um, but you know, under the covers, it's C Sharp. It's actually using the cross-platform implementation of C Sharp that Miguel de Casa designed years ago. So it's called the Mono Framework. And uh, so you can build uh, games that target all the platforms. There's another framework. This one's very interesting. It's called uh, Mono Game. Again, same community. You can see there's kind of a, in the C Sharp world, if you want to go cross-platform, you're working in what's called Mono. So it's Mono Game, or it's the Mono Framework, which is used by Unity, or it's Xamarin, which is using Mono uh, in, in its implementation. Um, so it's, it's have a lot of impact. Mono Game is a cross-platform implementation of Microsoft's XNA framework. So if you're familiar with building games for Xbox, or for Windows, or Windows Phone, the framework was called XNA. The cross-platform version of that is Mono Game. And there are games like Armed that are in the Windows 8 store that are built on Mono Game. I built one myself and put it in the store. Works incredibly well. It's a very straightforward um, uh, way of, of doing game development, and, and it uh, supports uh, Android and iOS and, uh, and Xbox and Windows and you name it. If you're an HTML developer, and you're a game developer, you might want to look at something like uh, Game Maker Studio from Yo-Yo Games. So this is a cross-platform game development tool. It will uh, generate HTML5 and JavaScript and allow you to target uh, all the different mobile platforms. There's another one like that that's called Construct2 from a company called Skira. Um, we actually use this in all of our game workshops with uh, students and professionals. We use Construct2. That's because the free version um, is very, very powerful, and you can publish to uh, Windows Phone and to Windows 8 uh, with their free edition. You have to understand that each one of these tools I'm showing you has a cost to it. This one, what's nice about it is no cost. Uh, for, so for targeting Windows, at least. If you get into iOS and Android, then, then there may be a cost to getting that, uh, that export capability turned on. All right. Another one's called Game Salad. You see there's, there's several of these, all very similar. They're all leveraging HTML5 and JavaScript um, in the code generation. But the act of building the game is drag and drop. That's one of the nice things about these tools. You're not, you're not in the code. You're, if you're a game developer, you want to focus on the artwork, the assets, the sound, the gameplay, the heads-up display, the layers, things of, like that. That's what these tools are good at. They give you an IDE. You lay everything out. You say what the rules are of the game. 
um, and then you test it in the browser, and when something doesn't work just right, you don't go change code, you're back into their tool and you're modifying properties of objects and things of that sort, it's all visual. If you are into the code, then another choice is CreateJS. This is a suite of JavaScript libraries that help you build games. There's one example out there that does a complete implementation of, oh geez, it's gotta be about 15 or 20 different uh, Atari games. All done in the, uh, they run in the browser. Uh, they've also been ported to Windows 8. And this is the bit.ly, it's kind of cryptic. I didn't come up with a proper name, but it's bit.ly slash R, capital R3, lowercase v2, capital D, capital H. And at least you'll get to the website and you can check out all, all the uh, uh, apps there that have been built with CreateJS. Um, there's also one of, a member of the team built the Catapult Wars uh, and did it with CreateJS and put that into the Windows 8 store and there's the bit.ly for that if you're interested in reading up on how that was done. I'll make these slides available too. After. Another uh, game development framework is ImpactJS. And uh, guy, uh, I told you about him earlier, Jesse Freeman, who's, uh, who's on my team, he's, he's in New York. He wrote the book called HTML5 Game Development. It's all about how to build uh, HTML5 games using ImpactJS. Uh, he's, he's built, he's just got tons of sample code online. He's got a book. Um, he, he is quite good and he has a bunch of games in the store right now. His favorite is got that, he likes that old 8-bit look and feel to the artwork. So uh, he creates a lot of his own artwork and uh, builds these games um, using HTML5 and JavaScript. And he gets them running in the browser and then he, and then he gets them running on Windows. And uh, now he's porting them to the phone. So just to close out, so I'm right at time, is uh, I wanna make sure you know about DreamSpark. Now, if you go to dreamspark.com, you could register there, but it sounds like what you should do is find out the URL for the Harvard DreamSpark site. And if you go in there, you can get Windows, you can get Visual Studio, you can get SQL Server, you can get you know, everything but an Xbox. All right, you can get basically all of our stuff there. So download the development tools, download the SDKs. You also get a free Windows 8 and a free Windows Phone developer account. That's a $150 value. All right, so students get accounts for free. I wanna make sure you guys get access to that. App Builder is our site for developers. Uh, if you go there and register, build.windowsstore.com, uh, you can earn points, you can register your apps, they can, they'll send you on some quests and you'll earn, you know, you'll earn points to be able to win stuff. There's also a ton, a ton of uh, training material up there if you're looking uh, for either apps or games. Some other training I found that, that might be you know, really applicable to what you're doing now is there is a C-Sharp Fundamentals online course, a uh, set of videos, and then there's also Windows Phone 8 for beginners. So if you're just getting into this space, you just want, hey, I just need to learn some C-Sharp and I need to just get started with Windows Phone, those two resources are fantastic. And then the work I was showing you is a project that my team did called API MASH which is at aka.ms slash API mash, and that will take you to GitHub. So we post all of our, uh, our stuff up on GitHub. So we've got a bunch of starter kits up there. You scroll down, we have starter kits for Windows and for Windows Phone, and we're, we're actually expanding this list. So everything you see here is being ported over to phone, but we've got Active Access, a Chuck Norris starter kit, Earthquakes and Bing Maps, Edmonds, Facebook, Foursquare, Instagram, Meetup, Messier Sky Objects, Rotten Tomatoes, Stack Exchange, Tumblr, Twitter, Univision, Wikipedia, World of Warcraft, Yelp, and ESPN. So that's all of these are all functional Windows 8 apps with the code and everything I showed you, that's the pattern they're all using, that whole open data API call, deserialize, bind to the UI. If you're interested in seeing how you get started building for Windows 8 and for Windows Phone, these are fantastic resources here, all built by my team. So uh, it's all free, it's up on GitHub. The way to do it, you just go to that site and click the download zip file. So we also include um, a lab workbook. 
There's three lab workbooks in there to just kind of take you through how to get started with this stuff. All right? So, wanted to make sure you were aware of that. And with that, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Bob. We've indeed posted at cs76.net a instructions for how you can get access to a DreamSpark account. So after Beautiful. tonight, you can get that, and then we'll post the slides later tonight. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. Why don't we go ahead and take a few minute break here while Dan gets set up, and then we'll transition to the third and final platform for the evening, Android. All right, so we're back. So the third act here is Dan Armendaris, who actually started this class several years ago. So the origins of S76 can be Tra uh, traced back to him and a colleague of his, and it was uh, I who came along a year or so after that that I finally got involved. So everything you've seen thus far is all traced back to Dan. So Dan's going to take a look at Android development with us, and without further ado, Dan Armandaris. Thanks. Hi, everyone. It's nice to be back, so to speak, even though in the context, in, from where you're sitting, it doesn't really seem that way. Uh, the class was very different back then. Just like mobile development has really evolved over the years. In fact, in the past year, since the last time that I actually um, co-taught this class with David, Android development has gotten a lot better, in, at least in the initial setup. And so we're going to talk about, as quickly as we can, we're going to try to shoehorn what I used to put four weeks worth of content into one hour. Um, so. Please allow me some leeway as I go a little quickly through some things. Of course, if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt at any time. And uh, hopefully, we'll be able to um, get you guys comfortable in such a way that you'll be able to do some Android development as soon as you go home. So just so that I can sort of get a sense of where everybody is, how many of you use an iOS device as your, say, primary phone, an iPhone? That's just about everybody. Now, is, are there any of you that use an Android device as your primary phone? OK. So for those of you that, that have your hands up, is that constant? Do you always use that um, device rather than an iOS device? All right, so for those of you that had your hands up, you probably are familiar with the, di the differences between the experience of an Android device and an iOS device. And this is actually really important, is that in order to develop on one of these platforms, um, it really is useful to have a sense of what that platform is actually like to be able to use it. And so if you are serious about actually doing cross-platform work, just to reiterate comments um, that, that Bob made in the first hour, it's really helpful to get a sense of that experience and how you will actually want to replicate that on, on this other device. And even though Android is considered to be the primary competitor to iOS, it's really difficult to put them, I think, on that same sort of comparison. They operate in very different ways. They have very different uh, reasonings behind di very different decisions that went into their implementation. And there's a lot of maybe, uh, let's see, what is the, the proper word to use here? There's perhaps a lot of difference between the, the two that, and a lot of confusion between the two that really just arise from these sort of basic differences, these basic differences that, that arose initially from when Google was first started developing Android and when um, Apple first started developing iPhone and iOS. Um, so this is actually pretty important for us as well as developers. So for, th for, for us as developers, what are some of the differences that we typically hear about, the, um, uh, about developing for iOS versus developing for Android? If you were to go out onto a tech blog and read the, the comments that people always post whenever Apple or whenever Google updates one of their hardware devices, people always complain about the same sorts of things, right? What are these differences? What do Android users dislike about iPhones, and what do iPhone users dislike about Android? Any ideas? Yeah. So perhaps if I could summarize that in, in a way to say that people consider Android to be a little bit more open than iOS. Um, and so that is, that is certainly true in many respects, even for us as developers. Um, when you create a developer account with Google, you pay a one-time $25 fee. You have an account with them. Basically, that $25 fee is to weed out people that just want to create, you know, flood the, the store with spam. 
It's not, a, it's not a terribly high fee, but it is one fee that you have to do. But then after that, you are free to submit your applications to the store. There's no review process. Um, and you basically create your, your application, you publish it to the store, and then that's it. It's up and ready for people to download. That's just one sense that um, Google might be a little bit more open than Apple. Um, but there's other ways as well. You have a little bit more control over your phone, some people would argue, a little bit more customization. Whereas in iOS, they try to really funnel you towards a certain type of experience, which in itself, is, I'm framing it not in the sense that this is a negative, but in fact that it's a very, again, a very different way of thinking about this. Google allows you to have a lot more options. And so it can, to people who are not familiar with the system, appear to be a little bit more complex. And so again, this is just that same sort of idea that we want to point out, the differences between the two. Did you have a, a question or a difference? So um, for the longest time, Android was open source, but they have, in fact, closed sourced some of them. So a lot of the code is, in fact, open source, but I think a lot of some of the now more basic functions are, in fact, closed source um, from Google. But yeah, that was also a primary difference between Apple and, and, and Android. Again, part we could perhaps uh, include this within this openness aspect. What about other things? Anything else as developers that might be different? Yes? Right, so there's, this is definitely a big one that we hear a lot, is that this fragmentation in Android devices. And in fact, this is a very important point that I want to bring up right away, is that um, there is some truth to this in, in what is actually fragmented. There are many different types of hardware devices available for, uh, for with the Google operating system, with the Android operating system, from different manufacturers, whereas Apple only is the only manufacturer of, the, of iPhone and iPad. There are many different manufacturers that use Android as a, as a platform. And even within that context, many people don't update their software as much as we as developers might want them to. And there's a variety of reasons for this. Some of them may not be aware that there's an update. Some of them, um, but I think one of the, the, the more pressing problems is that with many of the third-party phones that come out that have Android on them, they add a lot of stuff to it. Sort of like when you buy a, a PC and it has a lot of stuff installed. And my friend just bought an Asus, and he said that it had like a, oh my gosh, I wish I could remember exactly what it was, but it was like an Asus internet connection help wizard or some sort of very specific thing that he was kind of surprised that they actually bothered. This one hardware company actually bothered to create the software for it. And it's sort of a similar thing. A lot of these companies will, in fact, add their own additional UI components on top of the Android base OS, which further adds to perhaps some of the confusion between different users. When you pick up an Android device from, say, Samsung versus one that Google uh, created with just the base Android OS, it might actually look different, even though it has the same version of the OS because of this, these additional little flares and additional pieces of software that they will actually add on to this. Now, I don't want to confuse the issue. All of that stuff aside, the, one of the base issues in this fragmentation argument is the vi the, just the wide range of versions that are installed on hardware devices right now. So this is a chart that Google actually created. They release a similar chart every half month or every month or so, showing the distribution of devices that connect to the Google Play Store, which is the equivalent of, of the App Store on, um, on iOS. And as we can see here, there's really no one slice of this pie that makes up the majority of the devices. It really runs the gamut from Gingerbread, right here, which is a version 2 of Android OS, which is now several years old, all the way up to Jelly Bean, which is one of the later versions, version 4.1 and 4.2. And now there's an even newer version, 4.3, but I'm not sure that any devices have been released that actually have that or that it's actually been released at this point. Um, now, sort of the saving grace here with this is that if you did want to uh, target a lot of these users, you can actually create, of course, an application that is targeted at one of these APIs, one of these earlier APIs, and be able to get a large portion of the market. Um, uh, and by the market, I mean the available market for your application. Of course, if you wanted to use some API that's only available in some later version of the OS, then you will perhaps limit yourself in terms of the market that is available for that. But the Android OS isn't the only reason why this, this, in, why, um, this system might be considered fragmented. 
We also have things such as the screen size and the density. Like I said, the actual hardware devices are very, very different. And this is just, I, I intentionally left out some of the explanation of some of these, but just to show you that, that this is really all over the place with screen size on the left and screen density on the right. And Google goes through and on the website all differentiating all of these in terms of the exact pixel, exact pixel dimensions and the exact number of uh, dots per inch in each of the densities here. But really, we can see that we have a problem. And that is that if you want to create an application for an Android device that should work on a multitude of devices, you do have to contend with this issue that there are many different types of devices running many different types of OSs that have very different hardware capabilities. Now, to Google's credit, they have done everything that they can to try to combat this issue. Um, they really try hard to make it possible for you to create an application that can run on a lot of these sorts of devices. And in fact, um, one of the ways that they are able to do this is through this inclusion of resources within an application. So there is, and th we're going to get a little bit technical at this, at this moment before we kind of come back a little bit wider and talk about what exactly, uh, how exactly this works. Oh, and it looks like a font is missing here. So, <laughs> um, so basically, application resources are, stole, are stored in a resource folder. It just says RES. And there's a variety of different folders. It's a hierarchy of folders. And within that, there's a variety of other directories that you can include, like a drawable directory, which will include bitmap graphics or XML graphics. And there's also uh, a layout so that you can actually add layout information in XML form, or you could also add menu definitions in, in, um, in a menu directory as well. And what's really neat about this set of directories is that not only can you localize strings, but also you can modify the name of the directory itself to give a to the OS of what sort of resources are included in there. So let's say that you create a game, for instance. And in that game, you have perhaps a variety of assets, a variety of graphics that you've created for different devices. Perhaps you've created some relatively low resolution graphics for the lower DPI, um, the lower DPI devices. Or perhaps you've created some really high resolution graphics for the larger screens or for the devices that have very, very high DPI available. And what you can do is very much in the style of a CSS selector, which you might remember from your, your talk in web development, can you actually add some properties to these folders, which are, again, not intentionally masked here, but um, you will hopefully see them when you download the PDF when it is posted on the, on the website. Um, but you can actually add CSS style selectors, or not, I don't actually don't want to say that. It, they're, so they're selectors in the style of sort of CSS in the way that you can have these, these different selectors to target specific hardware devices or sp specific OS versions within each of these folders. So it becomes a little bit better. You don't have to cr release different versions of the same application, but you do, as you can imagine, have to create different versions of these assets for these different devices. And um, even though there's the argument, well, iOS is now fragmented between the iPad, the iPad mini, and uh, the iPhone, and the, the older versions, which did not have the retina displays, and all these different things, it's really not quite as bad as we have here on Android. This is an attempt on Google's part to make it a little bit better. Now, these resources are, in fact, included within a file that's called an APK file. An APK file is, in fact, your Android application. And what's neat about this APK file is that you can actually download an APK file onto your computer. You can rename APK to .zip, unzip it, and see what the contents of that, of, of that application actually is. It's kind of a, an interesting thing. You can actually see the resources that are available there. Anything that has not been compiled, it becomes very easy to look at. You can't look at the original source code, course, because it's been compiled and then included within that zip file and packaged into this Android format. But you can, in fact, look at some of the resources that are available within that one, uh, that one file. So this is important to realize that we have this APK file, which is, in fact, this application that we want to ultimately 
create. Within that application, we have these resources. Again, there's, you can create resources that are generic so that it would apply to all hardware devices, or you could even make them very specific by having multiple drawable directories for different di resolutions or for different, um, or for different density screens. And you could create different strings directories for localization, international localization, and so on. But really, the, the heart of all of the Android applications comes from this one XML file called the Android manifest file. The Android manifest file basically tells the system, the Android system, when it is launching your application, what it should expect. What is the name of this application? What is the minimum version of the OS that I can run this application? What are the different screens called activities that, that might be available? What are the permissions that this app requires? Does it require phone access? Does it require access to my contacts? Does it require GPS access? All of those sorts of things. So the OS parses this information and will make a determination. The OS will actually decide whether or not it can install and run this application based on the limits that you set in this XML file and also the limits of the device. So perhaps the user rejects your permissions because you want, um, you want to do all sorts of things on the user's device. You have your, your permissions are too loose and they decide that that's actually not quite a, a good thing to do. Well, you can modify all of this information here in your own application towards that end. Now, one of the things that is really important to realize about this as well is that you'll notice that here we, are at, we define a variety of things, um, but within this application, we actually have some components. Now, in this simplified version of the XML file, we have a single component called an activity. And this, when we start to talk about activities, this is where it really starts to deviate from the way that we would expect, um, we would expect it to work if we only are familiar with iOS devices. In Android, it's really difficult for us to talk about, um, to talk about an application as a single, all-enclosed app that runs entirely with your code. It is possible for instance, if I am creating a, let's say that I want to create a, an application that uh, perhaps uploads some photos from your phone up, into, uh, up to the web. Perhaps I have a photo sharing service of some kind and I want to be able to take your photos from your phone, user selected of course, upload them and share them on the web. So perhaps we would create this application to actually pull the user's photos, whichever ones they select from their photos app, and then upload those on behalf of the user to, to the internet. What's interesting about this is that we can actually have a very simple UI that presents the user with a couple of options saying, okay, well, what, log in first and tell us, what, um, uh, tell us what album you want to add these photos to. But when the user actually goes to select the photo, we could in fact launch an activity from an entirely different application, perhaps the photo application, and have the user select one of those photos in that other application. And this is relatively transparent. What the user sees is that they open up your app, there's a couple of options, you have to, have to log in or do whatever, and then, then they click the little choose photo button, and it appears seamless to them in that there's another window that appears on top of that UI that they were previously interacting with, so it appears as though it's one application, but now all of a sudden it's a photo selector from a different application altogether. Now this sounds kind of convoluted, but there's a great power to this in that we can generalize then, we can have this, this become very generalized if you wanted to include say Dropbox uh, support in your, in your application. You could actually make sure that the Dropbox application was installed and ask Dropbox to run the login activity and have the Dropbox application deal entirely with the authentication mechanism. Or perhaps you want to have your users be able to select one contact out of their contact list. Rather than fetching all of the contact information and displaying it to them, you can in fact ask the contact application itself to show the contact list and have the user select one of those contacts. So we have to differentiate between this idea of an application, which is what we would create and would be wholly self-contained, 
and what the user would actually run. When the user actually runs this application, it becomes a slightly different term that Google likes to use called a task. And the reason that it's called a task and not an application is because this task could actually run multiple applications unbeknownst to the user. Again, in the same context whereby they start your application and in this application, we want the user to be able to select a photo. So now we have our application running and they see this one activity. By the way, an activity is just a screen interface to the user that the user, the user would actually interact with. One screen is essentially one activity. So we have our own activity here. Now our application requests from the Photos app the photo selector. And so now another activity comes over and masks the one that we had below, but we have two applications running. So this is the difference between a task and an application. An application is what we are creating and is something that we are, uh, that, that we are eventually going to run, but you have to realize that activities are not necessarily so specific to your application that it's only run by your application. Depending on the properties that you apply to this activity, it's possible for you to create an activity that someone else's application could then run. So again, the example here um, would be, say, a, a contacts application, or let's say that um, I'm creating a, the new social media platform or what have you, and I actually want the user to be able to select one of their contacts from the Android device. And rather than create a contact list on my own, I can just request from the contacts app to show that contact selector, that contact list, and have it return the data to my application. So this is just a difference in terminology, a difference in implementation. Um, already, this provides quite a lot, of, a lot of power and a lot of openness. Notice that in, I never said that, well, maybe I did say, but I didn't mean to say that there is the contacts app. There's one built-in contacts app that you always have to use. Due to this sort of open nature of Android, it's possible to create a competing contacts app, place it on the Google Play Store, and, that, and then your users could then interface with that contacts app, with that new contact app instead. So rather than when my application requests a contact from the contact list, Rather than go to necessarily the default application, it could provide the user with a choice. Well, I see you have multiple contacts apps installed on your device. How, or rather, which application do you want to use to select this contact? Um, perhaps uh, another example would be, let's say that you just have a, an activity that's very simple. It just has a URL on it. You click on that URL, you don't want to uh, you don't want to implement an entire web browser yourself, and so you figure, okay, well, now I can just launch a web browser activity from another program to show that web page to the user. You can imagine, this, you can envision a scenario where there's multiple browsers installed on this computer, or uh, a computer, yes, but also on this, on this device. There's multiple browsers installed on it, perhaps Chrome, perhaps Opera, maybe some others as well. And you could provide the user, and, and by you, I mean this happens automatically, the, by the user clicking on that URL and you requesting from the Google operating system, from the Android operating system, that you want to open a URL, it might realize, oh, hey, there's two programs, there's two applications that actually support this type of data. Which one do you want to use? Do you want to use Chrome or do you want to use Opera? The user can then select one of those two options and proceed to show that, um, that information, that web page, load that web page in whatever browser they choose. And again, it appears to be relatively seamless. It doesn't look like it swaps applications to this other, to this other web browser. It instead just loads an activity um, in front of the one that you are using. So there's a variety of, um, there's a variety of components that can be part of your application. The activity is sort of the simplest one in the sense that it, this is that UI that the user is going to interface with. And what we are going to see in some code examples in a little while are just various forms of activities. But there, there's also different types of components that exist in an Android device as well. So there's activities, single screen with the user interface. If you want to have multiple screens, you certainly can, but that means that you're going to have multiple activities. 
that's not that, that big of a deal. It's just sort of an interesting thing to note. Um, another type of component that you could have is a service, which would be just a background task for long running operations. Let's say that you want to upload some information to your web server. Let's say, let's go back to that earlier example of having this photo sharing website and I want to have the user select a photo and be able to upload it to my website. If it's a big photo, we can run a service that uploads it in the background while the user does other things. We don't have to be bothered with it. Another example of a service might be a music player. We might have an activity that actually is the interface to that music player with play, pause, stop, volume control, forward, backward, so on and so forth. But the, the actual playing of the music occurs in the service, which occurs in the background, which allow you to change tasks. Again, this, this word tasks, which will allow you to change tasks so they could go to their web browser and continue listening to music from your same player. Now there's a couple of other things that, um, that get a little bit more specific, but just listed in the interest of completeness. A content provider is a way, it's just sort of a standard inter interface for other applications to access your data. So if I actually wanted to pull some data from a common application like contacts or photos, this is separate from the idea of, of actually bringing up activities, but maybe there is some interface that I actually want to expose um, to allow other applications to access the data that my application will actually create. Content providers is the way to do that. Broadcast receivers responds to system-wide announcements. So the phone will actually broadcast to all of the applications that the screen has gone, uh, the screen has gone dim or that the battery is running low or that the Wi-Fi has been turned on or off or a variety of other things. And even applications themselves can send broadcasts to the entire system as a whole. And you can define which, if any, of these that you're interested in actually respond to them, which is kind of an interesting thing. It allows certainly a, a bit of power in what your application can do. Now, um, activity is meant to, because it's user facing, it's going to be given a lot of priority by the Android OS whenever it's actually being run. So this will get a fair amount of CPU time. As you know, um, Android OS has been, has allowed background applications and background tasks to be, to be run for quite a while now, and one of their solutions was to prioritize what the user is actually interfacing with. Um, services, they also tend to be prioritized co rel relatively compared to some other things, but not quite as much as the, the user-facing activity. If they're running out of RAM, for example, perhaps it will free up some services that were running stale or running um, or that the user wasn't actually using. Um, content providers and broadcast receivers, these are smaller things, but they're meant to be very lightweight. They're meant to be, this is something that's, that's happening as a result of this system call, so let's get it done quickly and, uh, and, and be done with it. Now, are there any questions on this so far? I realize this is a little abstract, mostly an attempt to point out some of the differences between the way that iOS would work compared to how Android actually functions. Oops. So how then do we actually create um, one of these applications? Well, the short answer is that you go to developer.android.com. And this actually, for you as an Android developer, is your home base. There's an enormous amount of information here. The API documentation, there's a lot of updates whenever new versions come out, there's a lot, I mean, there's just a wealth of information that's fantastic. You can also download the SDK from this website. Um, you'll notice if you go to the website, though, that there's two versions of the SDK. There's the Software Development Kit, the SDK, and the Native Development Kit, the NDK. The Native Development Kit is a bit lower level. It allows you to write high-performance applications in C or C++, and in, and basically embed them within an Android application. We're going to essentially ignore the NDK, but if you are interested in high-performance native applications because you need to create a game, for example, a very uh, graphics-intensive game, then you might pay more attention to the NDK. But for the vast majority of us, we don't really care about that. It's nice that it's there, but we're not going to quite use it. The Software Development Kit is the way to go. So there's a couple of things to note about the SDK. First, when we create an Android application, we're actually writing code in Java. The end result isn't a Java program, and I'll explain more about that in just a moment, but the code that we write is actually in Java. Um, we use 
and we can use, if we want, again, as part of this openness, slightly more open um, uh, idea, we could use a variety of, of different um, uh, development environments. The one that's recommended and that's actually included with the SDK if you download it is Eclipse. You could just use plain text files if you wanted. You can kind of do it however you want. But you'll notice that using Eclipse tends to be the fastest and the best option for us. So what then, uh, how then, what is the process for us to build an Android application? Well, I mentioned that we have to write the code in Java. And there's a few th important things that, are, that distinguish this from Java, and I'll point those out when we actually look at a Hello World example. Uh, then we have to compile this into some Java bytecode, just as we would a, a regular Java program. But Android itself doesn't actually run Java code. In fact, the Android platform is a modified version of Linux that runs something called a Dalvik uh, virtual machine. So whereas in Java, it actually runs a Java virtual machine to run and execute the Java bytecode that, is, that has been compiled by the Java compiler, Google has created a slightly different version of this virtual machine um, that is a little bit more, well, it pays more attention to things like memory usage and, and CPU time and is a little bit more fair um, with regard to all of those things because in this mobile environment, we have to be very careful about battery usage and the amount of time that we spend in, um, uh, in each of these applications. So this bytecode is converted to a Dalvik compatible executable, which is basically just the modified version, again, of this, of this bytecode. It is running, in essence, Java bytecode, but it has been converted. Some things have actually been changed to be compatible with this Dalvik VM. So it's derived from Java, but it's not exactly the same. But this process allows us to write the code in Java and then create and compile it into uh, an application that is actually run and understood by the Stalvik VM within the Android platform. Now, after that, we have to package it up in a special way um, using zip and a, and a tool called AAPT, which actually includes some of the, it will actually pre-compile some of the information that we have, including the Android manifest file and a variety of other things, and actually create an Android package. So you might remember that um, I said before that this has gotten a bit easier. Well, it's always been a little bit easier than this. If you are kind of the, hard, the, the hardcore hacker person that loves to do everything manually, you can certainly do this. But for the rest of us, you can just download the SDK, which includes Eclipse, um, the IDE, and also the Android Tools plugin, the ADT plugin, and allows you basically just to go straight from the code directly to the end result, the Android package. You can find all of this on developer.android.com. Um, and one of the ways that it is much easier now is that they actually package all of this up into one download. That makes it much easier. Before, it was really a pain. You had to download Eclipse, and then you had to download the SDK, and then you had to download the e Eclipse plugin, and you had to get it all to work together. But luckily, we don't have to do that anymore. It comes in just one nice package. It makes it very easy for us to do development. So again, um, if you're actually interested in this, go to the website, developer.android.com slash SDK slash index. Um, download the SDK, and that's it. You pretty much can get started with it right away. So from here, how do we actually create an application? Well, of course, the Hello World app is the, well, the simplest thing that we can do to actually create an application. And there's a couple of things that I want to point out about the code in this Hello World app. And I'm, and I'm going to switch here to um, this other screen because it has better text color, and it makes it a little bit easier to take a look at what's going on. So at the very top of this Java file, we basically have a couple of things. One is, is uh, package information. How many of you have developed for Java in the past, or at all? Pretty much everybody. OK, so for those of you that haven't, um, it's very similar in syntax to C or C++. Of course, there's, there's a variety of differences. It's meant to be very heavily object-oriented. 
Um, and I'll try to point out as many differences as I can, as I can but I don't really want to do a Java primer right now. Um, there's, if you, if you do a search for Java tutorials, you will find some very excellent tutorials by Oracle um, that, that talk a little bit more about this. But we have to put all of this code into the scope of a package, into, the, into a particular namespace, and so that's what we're doing in this first line. Then we're going to import a variety of libraries that actually make it possible for us to run this code. Um, the activity library, which we just talked about, and a couple of other things which are actually required for us to run this. The bundle um, is required by the OS. Um, this log one isn't really required unless we're doing some logging, which are, there's some very basic logging at the very bottom of this, of this code, which we'll look at in just a second. And also a widget. Um, you can maybe guess by the name what this actually does, but it's essentially this. It allows you to place a text object on the activity and allow you to view some, some text on, that, um, on the screen. So that's just all sort of some, um, some initial setup that we have to do. And this is the contents of the code. Now, one thing that you'll notice, for those of you that are Java developers, that's very different from other things, is that there's no main method. There is no method that makes it very obvious where we're actually starting the application. And the reason for that is that the main method is, is done by the operating system itself. What the OS does is it looks at the manifest file that we've actually created. And so this is a full-fledged Android manifest file that has been not redacted for simplicity so that we can actually see how some of these things work. Again, notice that this is the manifest XML element. It uses a minimum SDK version of 3, which is now ancient. There's no need for you to use version 3. That's like Android 1.5 or something. So only if you want maximum compatibility do you really need to do that. But even then, there's problems using minimum SDK version of 3. It implies certain permissions that are um, not necessarily what you would want. Um, I think it wants full access to contacts and some other stuff that if you just upgrade the minimum SDK version to 4 or 5, then you lose a lot of these problems that, that actually existed. But this is meant for maximum compatibility here. Now the application, within it we actually define where the icon is for that app on the home screen of the device. It's within, you'll notice, at drawable. Remember I mentioned that drawable directory within our resources. We can have various resolutions of our icons to support the different density and different sized screens that might exist. Um, similarly, can we actually apply a label to the name of that application within the string resource? And provide, you'll notice that here we're looking for a specific resource within the string directory called an app name, um, which um, you'll just have to um, you'll just have to trust me for now that it says something in English. Um, now if we skip this and go down to activity, notice that we have defined one activity here. And within it we have this, this idea of an intent filter. And what this intent filter actually does is it notifies the OS what this activity should actually do. And there's a variety of, of filters that we can apply to it. Perhaps we want to restrict this activity from being open in other applications. Remember that I mentioned that within task, we can have other applications request an activity. We can explicitly disallow or allow that with these intent filters. But also, we apply these two elements to this intent filter, telling the, um, the OS that this is the main activity, and this is the one that I want launched on boot, when, or on boot is opening the application itself. And so really, there's no main method, but that's because we've told the Android OS that we have this activity, and this is the one that we want to run. Now, the activity itself, <coughs> excuse me, the activity itself goes through a life cycle of, of, of sorts. There's a variety of methods that allow you to run some code when the activity has first been, first been called upon to actually open, and then things have been rendered on the screen, and then it's finally ready for use by the user. We're going to ignore a lot of those for now, and I'll defer to the, um, the Android documentation for you to get more information on that. But now we can take a look again at our Hello World code and realize how this is actually working. We have a public class, code one. This is just the, the class for this one activity. Extends activity because this is, in fact, an object 
of type activity. I actually want to create some code that launches an activity and displays something to the user. And within that, we have this one method, onCreate. This method is invoked by the OS within this activity object whenever this activity is about to be started. It's saying, OK, I am about to display this activity, so I'm going to create it and display it on the screen. What do you want me to do? It's asking this code, and by asking, I mean it's invoking this method, which allows our code to actually create the layout and apply a layout onto this activity and then display it to the user. So the next few lines, um, this super.onCreate, we just have to make sure that we actually invoke the, act, the main activity classes on create method just to do any house cleaning. Otherwise, you will get a very nasty error from, uh, um, from the Android plugin or from the SDK when you do this. And then programmatically, are we actually going to create a text view that says some text? We're going to create a text view object. Um, it's just basically instantiated in this first highlighted line. Next, we're going to set the text to be displayed by this text view. And then we are going to set the content view, which is the content displayed within this activity. So this is not necessarily a mysterious function call. This is actually a function call that's implemented by the Android activity class that allows us to set the layout for this activity. So basically, the layout for this activity will be what? Any guesses based on this code? Yeah. That's right. So all the only thing that will be on the screen when we actually run this activity will just be a text view. But that text view itself is, is invisible. We don't actually see its bounds. We just see the text that's contained within it. So we should expect to see the text, oh, hi. Now, there's some logging capability stuff down here, which if we had a little bit more time, I would explain is very useful for us to actually get messages from our code back into this really cool little section down here, logcats, which allows you to actually run. It's sort of a console-like way of actually being able to look at, um, um, at errors from your activity. In fact, you can see it says this is an error, which masks or which uh, replicates what we see here. This is very good for debugging in the Android world. But if I actually run this code, this is what we would see. So very much like in Xcode, how you have an emulator for iOS, do you have an emulator for um, Android devices as well? So what's cool about this is that this is actually um, an emulated Android device. And so I can go to the, oh, I can't see the, uh, We've been bitten by the resolution bug. There's some buttons down here that allow me to go to the home screen, and we can sort of play around with this version of, of the Android device. Unfortunately, it's cut off. So rest assured, it's there. You can click on it, um, but not right now. But what this allows us to see is our Hello World application. We have here our activity, which takes up the entirety of the screen. By default, the theme was black. We didn't get to see that, but it's elsewhere, actually, in, in uh, within the, the um, the package itself, we have our one text view. It says our text, and that's about it. Up here, this is just the title bar for the application itself. It's a little confusing at first when you expect to only see this, and you also see the title of the application, um, but realize that that is actually just the Android OS displaying a little title above the application itself. We could give a flag in the manifest that would request that this activity become full screen and hide everything, but we haven't set that flag. We've just done a very simple manifest file here. And of course, we have our uh, system-wide uh, status bar at the very top here. Now, there's a few other things that I want to show you about this. Um, I'm going to make a few of these activities available in the source code for you to download and actually play around with. We don't really have a lot of time to go through them, but hopefully, if you just go through them one at a time, they will progress uh, in such a way that you will be able to hopefully start following along as we make slightly more complicated layouts, start adding second um, activities, and start doing other things with the Android OS. But there's a couple of things that I want to point out about the SDK itself. One of them is that this IDE, again, is Eclipse. This is not written by Google, but in fact is a larger open source project. If you already have Eclipse, download it because you do development in, 
in other languages, or even in Java, you can actually download the SDK without including the IDE, the IDE itself. You can just download the SDK, the plugin, and follow some steps on the developer website to get all of that working in your own version of Eclipse that you might have already installed. But if you don't have it installed already, don't worry about it. You can just download everything and have it work out of the box. Once you have everything set up, though, if you go to this menu, the window menu, you'll notice that you have a couple of new Android options. And I'll zoom in here so that you can see them. You have Android SDK Manager, Android Virtual Device Manager, um, and Android Lint, which is a, a, a checker. But it's these two that we are worried about now, the SDK Manager and the Virtual Device Manager. The SDK Manager allows you to download different versions of the SDK. So if you want to build an application against a specific API number, you have to make sure that you have downloaded that SDK. So if you download all of this, this is going to take up a lot of space. It's several gigabytes worth of, of information that has to be downloaded onto your computer. But then you could compile your application against any one of these uh, API targets, and, uh, and it will work just fine. In this case, because I had set the in the manifest file, the minimum SDK version whoops, of 3, as we can see here, I have to make sure that I, in fact, have that version installed. And as you can see, Android 1.5, which is an API level of 3. So realize that there's two different versions. Um, the public-facing version is the string Android 1.5, but the API level is an always incrementing integer, which started at 1. Uh, basically, the, the earliest version that was released to consumers was API level 3. Um, and it just has been going up ever since then. So here we can see that I, in fact, have the SDK platform and the APIs installed. You can do that on your own for whatever version you want to run. But the more fun one, I would say, is the Virtual Device Manager, which allows you to create virtual devices, emulated devices, in just about any configuration that you can imagine. So if we were to create a new device here, what this is going to allow us to do is to create a new emulator of sorts that replicates certain features of a device. So we can specify a variety of things. We can give it a name. So I'll just say Android 2.4, just for example. Now we can see here that when I click on device, we have a list of different device sizes. Um, pick your poison that goes all the way from the Nexus 10, which has an enormous 10-inch screen, all the way down to some of the earliest um, uh, Android devices including a 240 by 320 screen, it's pretty small. Um, we can select any of these and actually create an emulator so that you can actually test your application across a wide variety of devices before you even release it to the Google Play Store. I'm just going to, um, for fun, select the Nexus 10. Um, I can select the target. So this is the API. Uh, this is the, basically the OS version that this should run, that this hardware device should run. Now, it is possible for you to get yourself into trouble here and run an ancient version of a target on a new device that would not ever have that installed. Um, so you have to sort of be careful here that you select ones that would make sense for that. Sometimes you get the ability to change the CPU if there is, in fact, an option between ARM and Intel. Hardware keyboard would be emulating an actual hardware keyboard on this device. Um, Hopefully the rest are somewhat self-explanatory. You do would get to set things like the RAM size, the amount of heap that your virtual machine would have for this application, um, the amount of internal storage, if that device actually has to emulate an SD card. And notice a couple of options down here. Snapshot, which if you've used virtualization um, software elsewhere, like VMware or Parallels or any sort of thing, when you actually close that virtualized window. It saves the state of the memory and will allow you to restart it from there. Similar thing um, here with Snapshot. You can actually save the state between times that you close and then reopen the, um, the, the emulator, which is pretty good because sometimes it takes a while for these emulators to load. And it, they now have also um, hardware accelerated GPU, which is great because before it was software and it was just it was just the worst. It was so slow. OK, so you can create one of these, and you can have actually a variety of them. Now, in order for you to test your application on an emulated device, you have to first, here's the steps, make sure that you download, whoops, 
Make sure that you download the appropriate SDK in the SDK Manager, and then create a virtual device in the Virtual Device Manager. Then you have an emulator that you can actually run. Um, so in this case, I actually have my Android 2.3.3 running, as you can see right here. So I'm emulating an Android 2.3.3 device in this emulator. Now there's a couple more things I want to point out. One of them is that there's this number to the left of the name, 5554. Now this is pretty cool. What this allows us to do is to log in to the emulated device from our computer. So in this case, I can open up a uh, terminal window, type in telnet localhost, and then that port number, that number actually coincides with the port that's running within our computer or within the emulator and um, is exposed through our computer. When I hit enter, notice that I connect to this emulator. And this is something that you can really only do through the emulated devices. Um, now you can type help and you actually get a variety of things that you can do. So you can actually force the emulator to change its state in a variety of interesting ways. You can have, for example, it follow a set of geo tracks. So maybe your application is actually uh, really dependent on, on geolocation, so you could actually provide it some geo tracks and observe how your application reacts as the phone is not, is not taken in a physical sense, but is taken in, a, in, a, um, in, a, in an emulated sense through that geolocation track. You can also do a variety of things like what happens when, um, when I change the network settings on it and say the, the user loses cell phone signal and they only have Wi-Fi or, or vice versa. How does my application actually react to any of this, to, to all of these sorts of things? You can also send the emulator an SMS, which is pretty funny. Um, it, but it is actually useful, especially if you are um, creating an application that is relevant to that, and a variety of other things, as you can see here. Now, one, one of the really neat things here is that if you have an Android device um, and you are doing Android development, you can plug in that device using USB to your computer, and you will be able to develop directly onto that device. You might actually have to check off, check a few settings in the, in the developer menu that says allow development mode and some other things. Um, but what this essentially allows you to do, really without having to deal with any certificates or anything like that, is that you can very quickly and easily connect an Android device to your computer and try your program not only on an emulated virtual device, but also on your physical phone or physical tablet as well. And can you also run, you can also um, connect to it and, and uh, run a variety of, of, of commands. It's really limited in these physical devices because you don't have root access to the file system unless you have actually rooted the device, which is an entirely different um, issue. But even though that is um, an option, it's probably better to test this out on, on an emulated device and then see how it behaves on the physical one, but that is certainly an option for you there as well. And one of the great things about um, the Android SDK, very much like the iOS, um, uh, the iOS development in Xcode, is that once you understand some of these simple principles, once you understand Java, once you understand how an APK is built and, and what it's uh, what its hierarchy of, of files actually looks like, it becomes very easy for you to look up the APIs that are given to you in the API documentation and quickly make an application that you would want to run or that you would want to deploy to users. Um, and so hopefully then, this has been um, a good summary of how you can actually get started with it. So if you are interested in this, go ahead and go to the developer website, download the SDK, and get started on Android development. And until then, I want to thank you very much. Um, I think David has a couple of last words, but um, thank you all for, for your time.